By now, I'm sure you've seen this story, the footage of these transgender athletes, men running in a track and field race against biological women in Connecticut for the high school championships. It's ridiculous, and obviously it's unfair and it's wrong. And four female athletes sued because of it. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals turned down their lawsuit, but they got it wrong. And now there's been a development in that case. Joining us right now to talk about it is the lawyer from Alliance Defending Freedom, Senior Counsel Christiana Kiefer, and one of those four athletes, sprinter and long jumper, Selena Sol. Thanks for joining us. Thank Thanks you for having us. us. Now, first of all, do I have this correct? Was this a high school track meet that we were looking at, Selena? Correct. And uh, these are uh, two male athletes who were running as women. And because of the rules in the state of Connecticut, I mean, I'm sorry, you're a great runner, but they smoked you. So <laughs> um, if you could, I want to hear from you first before we get into the legal argument. Uh, what kind of protest did you guys have even before this race occurred? I mean, it's outrageous. You, I know what it takes to be, not personally, but I know people who are in track and field. You worked your entire life to get to this point. This is the pinnacle of your high school career. And now you've got this daunting task to run against a man. Yes, I started track and field when I was eight years old after my mother introduced it to me. And from the moment I stepped foot on the track, I fell in love with the sport and couldn't wait until high school to be a part of an organized team. But unfortunately, once I got to that point, I was forced to compete against two biological males. I raced against these athletes over a dozen times and without fail, lost every single time. And us elite female athletes, we would put in so many hours in practice just to shave fractions of a second off of our times to win, not to place third and beyond. And that was always the case when I was racing against these two biological males. Yeah, and again, I mean, it's just obvious on the face of it. Uh, it's why we have women's sports and men's sports, especially in disciplines like this, where there are such distinct biological differences. So, Christiana, explain this to me from a legal perspective. How did the Second Circuit get this so wrong? It seems so obvious and unfair. It does. Well, the Second Circuit essentially looked at Selena and the other three female athletes and said that their losses and their incorrect records, their missed opportunities just didn't matter. And that's just wrong. Um, Selena and the other female athletes deserve the right to make their full case under Title IX, which is why we were delighted to hear that the full Second Circuit decided on its own to rehear the case um, yeah. because I think they recognize the panel got it wrong. This is huge. So uh, for everyone who doesn't know, most of you do because I've got a very smart audience. Audience, but when a circuit court of appeals hears something, it's, it's usually three judges that see it, hear it, right? But the, there is always the opportunity to go on bank, which basically all of the judges get to come in on this. And you're telling me that this was triggered internally. You didn't even have to make the argument? That's exactly right. None of the parties even had to ask for the Second Circuit to take this on banc. They looked at it internally and recognized it needed to be revisited. That's and great. so we're excited to see what the court will do. So, Selena, I, I, listen, sadly, there are still people who will watch a story like this and say, well, it's just athletics. What does it matter? First of all, it's fundamentally unfair. Second of all, just for your own personal dreams and hopes. I'm the father of two daughters who pl both played sports and it would crush my soul, if I can say that to you, Salita's soul, to see them deprived of the ability to compete fairly. But there's also something very tangible here. When you're competing for the high school championships in a state, there's college opportunities that are open to you. There's a whole lot of very real great rewards that come your way, aren't there? There are, and I was booted out of competing in the New England championships in the 55 meter dash my junior year, I qualified in the four by 200 meter relay, I qualified in long jump, and I was forced on the sidelines to watch my own event, knowing I should have been there because if those two athletes weren't there, I would have been in, I would have qualified. And that was on a much faster track where you post better times, college scouts come to those meets. So there's no telling what I could have lost by missing out on qualifying for that meet. And there are dozens upon dozens of other girls in the state of Connecticut that lost out on the exact same things because of these two biological males. Have these athletes, these men, uh, have they ever reached out to you personally? Have they ever said, listen, I get it, I'm sorry, but at the same time, I feel like I should have the opportunity. I mean, has, have they had inter any interaction with you just out of respect as a fellow competitor? I have never had any interaction with either of the two biological males, no. And I'm just curious, and forgive me if this is embarrassing, but were there locker room interactions. I mean, they you all get dressed in the same locker rooms and things like that, don't you? 
In track and field, no, because all of the meets are farther away and it can be up to 20 schools together. So in track and field, we never had to share locker rooms. Okay. But the bathrooms, yes, there are many instances where I saw them going into the girls' bathroom, but in track and field, the locker rooms weren't were not a thing. If you raised an objection to the authorities there, either from the, uh, uh, I don't know, the NCAA, whatever the, the, the uh, governing body was, what did they say to you? Was there any sympathy at least? The CAAC did not care at all. We reached out to school administrators, to legislators, to officials at the CAAC, and nobody wanted to hear us out. They, everyone kept shifting the blame around, and we ultimately had no choice but to file the Title IX complaint and then the lawsuit when trying to talk to people went nowhere. Ms. Kiefer, uh, what's unique about Connecticut? Because we've seen this come up in other states, right? And uh, and this, I believe other states have, have cited on the sides of the athletes. Is there something unique to the way the rules are written in the state of Connecticut that allowed the courts to sort of overlook the obvious? Well, Connecticut's athletic association policy is one of the most extreme in the nation that I've seen. It allows a male to just self-identify into the female category. Um, in fact, one of the male athletes competed on the boys team for three seasons and turned around and just a couple weeks later began to compete in the female category. A couple so, weeks? A couple weeks? Yeah, it's remarkable and it's really shocking. And I think that's why in part you're seeing states across the country look at Connecticut and say that is such an extreme unfair situation and even unsafe situation for female athletes that you're seeing state lawmakers step up to the plate and pass legislation to protect female athletes like Selena. And Ms. Kiefer, you cited Title IX here. And of course, Title IX, uh, when it was instituted in the early 70s, there were a lot of reasons for it. But one of the main reasons was to give an opportunity for female athletes. It was really to sort of um, set a standard for women's athletics at the high school and collegiate level. Ironically, they're actually using Title IX and twisting its meaning to allow these men to defeat women and actually take the place of women, aren't they? That's exactly right. In essence, turning Title IX on its head in a very regressive way. Uh, Title IX's crowning success really has been the athletic opportunities that's provided for young women like Selena. And so if we want a future where girls like Selena can continue to be on the podium to showcase their talents and earn those college scholarship opportunities, then we have to protect the integrity of women's sports. Selena Soul, it is not easy to stick your neck out and be the tip of the spear on something like this, especially amongst, I'm guessing, many of your, uh, your generation, your colleagues who really jump on board with the whole, the whole transgender agenda. Has this been hard for you? Have you had to deal with some pretty harsh criticism because you're standing up for yourself and so many other young women out there? I've gotten plenty of hate through social media. I like to say that I've gotten everything from death threats to marriage proposals, <laughs> but I don't let any of the negativity impact me. I just focus on the positive and all the messages of love and support that I get, not only my friends and family, but from people all over the world. Any of the marriage proposals, you know, pass your dad's screening process? <laughs> I mean... Unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. Maybe, oh. maybe in the future. And real fast, were you, have you been able to run track in college? Have you been able to follow your, your dreams? I tried, and unfortunately, it didn't work out to me. I would have loved to pursue uh, track and field further. But for now, I'm just doing it doing it on my own, hoping that I can uh, join a club team. Well, uh, listen, you're, uh, you're running a race that's frankly more important right now, and you're defending uh, logic and reason and reality and truth. And like I said, you're fighting for a lot of young women out there. So thank you. Thank you. As the father of daughters, I appreciate it. More to come on O'Connor tonight.